Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Beth. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Dan. I'm an alcoholic. Oh, apparently I'm starting. Um, we're going to do the doctor's opinion tonight, um, and I guess we're just going to dive right in. Um, just wanted to say, I think we're going we're gonna to be trying to pick out some stuff that uh, where we can sprinkle in some personal experience. You know, we talked about qualifying our, our own alcoholism. Um, so, yes, we will be, I think, hitting some important spots, but also trying to relate it to where and how we drink. Um, anything you want to say? In, in, no. No. And then, uh, and also uh, maybe try to pick out a couple spots um, where the book points out how we ought to be trying to live our lives. Um, principles. Right. Yeah. So, you know, instead of just going through it and uh, and using this chapter to identify the physical symptoms of alcoholism in ourselves, also try to really figure out, you know, are there actually instructions for living in here as well, or at least in, the, in a somewhat general sense. Um, and I think there are. Um, and uh, I think the first thing that we were going to jump to um, was on that first page of the doctor's opinion, which in the fourth edition is page XXV, um, is, the, uh, is the second paragraph of the doctor's first letter at the end of the paragraph. Uh, good earning capacity was an alcoholic of a type I had come to regard as hopeless. Um, you know, and it was... It, it's important, I think, that that we make sure that the people that we're working with or that we make sure that we are hopeless when we can sort of embark on this journey, the spiritual journey, the, the steps when you get into alcohol, whatever you want to call it, the beginning. Um, you know, they talk in the book about being as desperate as dying can be, and that's really important. That's huge, you know. I mean, there's, there's not a lot of reason to really seek out this solution if you're not beaten. Um, I had a kid once ask me... Um, you know, do I really need to believe the first step in order to do the second? And this is when I was maybe two and a half years sober. I had done the big book work. Um, we were going, going to Burnersville. We were, we were trying to seek out other young people that were not quite as sick as we were. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that wasn't a joke. Oh, and um, <laughs> and um, and, and it's funny because my initial response was the one that I sort of got when I came to AA. You know, when, you, when you know, the steps are suggested, you don't have to do anything 100%. You know, all these sort of cliche things that I heard when I was in early AA um, that I think are kind of meant to make you feel better about some of the stuff that you're going to have to do. Um, but whatever. And I almost said that. I said, no, I mean, you know, it's sort of just a suggestion. Um, but it didn't. Because uh, I had some some experience with the book, I had learned what alcoholism is, and I told them, you know, yeah, yeah, you do need to really believe the first step. There's really not a lot of reason to seek power if you think you have some. Um, so, you know, and, and went on to uh, do some more work with this this individual, and then he decided he wasn't an alcoholic. He decided he had power in his life, and, and he went back out. I don't even know that he drank. I think he just disappeared from the rooms of AA. I think uh, maybe he did have power. Um, the point is, though, I think it's extremely important to believe that that you're completely powerless when you come here. You wanna, you wanna... Yeah, for me, um, for me, I was not completely hopeless until I had six years sober. Um, I know that maybe that sounds crazy, <clears throat> but for me, um, you know, the first six years. Uh, or six and a half, I don't even know how long it was, um, uh, that I was sober, I was still, I was I was without alcohol and drugs, but I was unaware of the big book and the steps within the big book or whether it was presented to me and I was too blind to see it. But I still thought that I was managing my recovery. I thought that I was managing my sobriety, Um and it wasn't my fault that I couldn't hold a job for longer than a year. or And it wasn't my fault that I couldn't live in one spot for more than four to six months. Um, you know, I was this perpetual victim, um, and things were happening to me. Um, and my life did not get better. 
uh, it felt better. And I think that there's a there's a definite difference in that when you know we can feel better, right? And we're gonna talk about frothy emotional appeal in a little bit in a little bit. But it's that you know you come into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and you get this frothy emotional appeal and it makes you feel better. It makes you feel like we'll love you till you can love yourself. You know, and it uh, it makes you feel better. It makes you feel like somebody's got your back. Um, when in reality, for me, what it took to be able to swallow were, what we're going to be going through in the next couple of weeks in this book was is that no person could have my back. Only God can have my back. And it took me um, continuously seeking out people to have my back until I realized that every single one of them was fallible and human. And I needed God to have my back. And so, it, you know, it took me, I was, you know, in a, in a, in a convention, Area 44 convention, you know, 500 alcoholics, all sober and going to meetings. And uh, I wanted to kill myself, drink, and throw my car off of an overpass. And so um, that's what it, it took me, you know, to exhaust. You know, we talk, we talk about this a lot. you got to exhaust all of the uh, avenues of, of what we think will make us better before we're willing to actually turn to God. So that was, you know, I was six, six or six and a half years sober when that happened. Yeah, and you know, and, um, you know I was just trying to think about what did hopeless look like for me, and I touched on it briefly last week, but hopeless for me basically looked like, you know, I, I, I could only leave my dingy New York apartment for the 20 minutes a day it took to go get more alcohol. Um, Despite how much I want to be a part of life, despite how much I want to take part in my own education or just be in the city. I mean, the city's a really cool place, and, I, and, I, and I'd like to live there, but I just couldn't, couldn't pull it off. Um, being unable to drink despite wanting to, uh, to stop drinking despite wanting to. Um, you know, this is what hopeless looked like for me as a person unfamiliar with the big book, you know. Um, I'm one of those people that call an interview. And... Uh, <clears throat> So for me, it was like, you know, I didn't have anybody trying to sort of coaching me towards whether or not I'm an alcoholic. I think there had been several points in, in, in my drinking where somebody said to me, hey, you might have a problem. And I'd either laugh it off, um, be really into the idea in like the wrong way, or, uh, or just kind of plain ignore them. Um, but it had come up. But, you know, I never really understood what that meant. You know, like, what do you mean I have a drinking problem? I drink too much? Okay, I'll drink a little less. Um, you know, no one had ever framed it in the in the in in the terms that you may not be able to drink at all. You may not be able to drink normally like another person. You may have a physical condition that makes you drink compulsively, and a mental obsession that tells you you don't have that physical condition. You know, these are not things that I could that I that I was familiar with. All I knew was, despite how badly I wanted to not drink every day, I drank anyway. You know, that's as binary binary as it can be. You know, I could, it could not get any simpler. So when I got here and they asked me if I believed I was powerless over alcohol and they explained to me exactly what that meant, I was like, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't have called if I wasn't, you know. Um, I didn't know what to do anymore. You know, I knew of AA from years before. Somebody said, hey, you should take this pamphlet out. And I was like, what, are you guys hurting me? Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and so it was in the back of my mind. AA is for alcoholics. AA is for people who have drinking problems. And, you know, I mean, intergroup was pretty easy to find. Um, you know that I'm not thinking about it. I don't know how I found intergroup because there was not much in the way of Internet back then, and I didn't have a smartphone. I don't know. That's weird. I should look into that. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but, yeah, I mean, it was literally just, it was black and white. I want to stop. I can't. You know, what am I going to do? i got to find AA. And I went and I found AA in the midst of a drunken stupor. And that was it. But that, that's kind of what hopeless looked like. Um, the next bit that we, uh, that we wanted to touch on was, as part of his re rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conception to other alcoholics, impressing upon them that they must likewise do likewise with still others. Why don't you start there? Um, not only is this the second must in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's also a principle. This is that this is what we're supposed to be doing with our lives. You know, um, that... Uh, that once we get the spiritual awakening, once that we, we get what works, we're supposed to present this to other alcoholics. Um, it's real easy these days. You know, you can present this stuff to alcoholics um, in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. We no longer have to. We can if we wish to. 
but we no longer have to seek out hospitals or sanitariums or, you know, as Chris puts it, the booby hatch. You know, we don't have to do these things anymore. There's, I have never, ever, ever had a problem um, getting people to work with uh, when I'm healthy. And, um, you know, we, we present this, right? This is what we're supposed to be doing with our lives. It's not what we're supposed to make our lives, right? We're not supposed to you know, just be a walking big book all of our lives. Um, but it's a principle that when we get something, we're supposed to give it away. And, you know, it, it relates directly to Alcoholics Anonymous, but it's also a principle that we should be using in our lives. You know, when we know how to do something, we should be open and willing to sharing that knowledge with somebody else so that somebody else can learn how to do it and therefore carry on. And then that's how, you know, but, it's, uh, you know, as it says in, in, in working with others, not, nothing will so much ensure us immunity to drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. So this is like a part of the, um, the, pro, the suggested program of recovery. Um, it's a principle. These are actions that we should be taking to grow spiritually. Um, and there it is, you know, on the first page of the doctor's opinion is that in order to live, this is what we have to do. So... You know, it's not, and I just want to make it clear, it's not about going to a meeting and giving a newcomer your phone number. It's not about, like, that's not what they're talking about. You know, um, for me, it requires me to get their phone number, to talk to them on the phone, have them over my house, get them a cup of coffee, and actually explain to them what happened to me and the process thereof that I went through. Um so that's, again, you know, I'm big on my personal responsibility to make sure that Alcoholics Anonymous stays Alcoholics Anonymous. So. Word. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and then, you know, not, not, to just give a lip, <laughs> not just to give a lip service, but at the end of that same paragraph, it says this man and over uh, 100 others appear to have recovered. And we'll get into exactly what that means, but, you know, what it's, I think it's referring to the fact that we recovered from this hopeless state of mind and body. Um, you know, recover in the sense that we don't suffer, suffer from those symptoms anymore. Um, and then, so on the next page, just going to go on to this uh, after the letter, in the first paragraph after the letter, uh, that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. The same, he confirms what you have suffered alcoholic torture must believe, that the body of the alcoholic is quite as, ab quite as abnormal as his mind. It did not satisfy us to be told that we cannot control our drinking just because we were maladjusted to life that we're in full from, from reality, or we're outright mental defectives. Um, one of the things that I like about the doctor's opinion is that I think that, like, you know, when I read through it, I feel like it hits upon exactly what we're going to be coming, you know, dealing with in the ensuing chapters. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's very much about the medical take on, on the physical parts of alcoholism, but it, you also see, I think, a little bit of everything else, right? So when it says it did not satisfy us to be told that we were just, uh, we were drinking just because we were maladjusted to life, you know, we were talking about it earlier today, you know, and when, when, I when I hear that, I think of the Bedell, I think of the too, you know. Um, I'm not drinking just because I'm discontent. I'm not drinking just because uh, I don't even know them all. I'm, I can't control my emotional nature. I can't do, keep a, you know, make a living. I can't do all these things. I, I, I can't function in the world as a human being. You know, that's not why I'm drinking. Um, those reasons start to help later. You know, I mean, it's certainly nice to get away from that 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 crazy thinking. You know, once I'm already sort of progressed into alcoholic drinking, but that's not why it started. You know what I mean? The reason that I drank as like an alcoholic originally was because I had this this we'll talk about it later this allergy and this and this mental condition. Um, you know, and, and the way I see my own drinking is that you know it's, that's how it started. And then it built into the spiritual malady as I became more and more beaten. Without even knowing it, I became more and more morally and spiritually beaten by the fact that I could not control my own drinking. Um, you know, so that, you know, so yeah, we didn't, we didn't, we weren't drinking just because we were maladjusted to life or we we're outright, or outright mental defectives. Um, you know, uh, these things were true to some extent. In fact, a considerable extent, uh, but our bias were sickened as well. You know. Um, I can remember times when I was drinking, and you can have a turn in a second. Uh, <laughs> I, remember you, time, I remember times when I was drinking, and, like, it, it was weird, right? You know, it was after I had gone to AA, and I had, I had been sober. You know, I would stay sober a couple weeks at a time. You know, I'd do, like, a two-week clip and then drink. Do a two-week clip and then drink. And it was on one of those 
um, intermissions where I, uh, I started drinking. And as soon as I started drinking, I remembered I'm an alcoholic. Um, you know, so the first thing I wanted to do, realizing, remember that I'm an alcoholic, I shouldn't be drinking, was stop. You know, um, and it, it, it was the strangest thing, you know, and I, you know, now, knowing what I know now, I can plainly see that having that first drink restored me to sanity, um, which is, which blows my mind all the time. Restored me to sanity to the point where I can remember, this is bad. You're in a shitstorm. Stop. And I'm thinking to myself, stop, 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 stop. And it's just, <laughs> and it's not, it's just not happening. Um, you know? Making a conscious decision to not drink and doing it while I'm making that decision. Um, scary. Yeah. Um, I know for me that, uh, you know, I went to rehab and then they, you know, I drank. And then I was an intensive outpatient and I drank. And, uh, and I was going to meetings and I was drinking. And I remember um, I remember a very good meeting. It was uh, the Sunday 3 o'clock uh, St. Saint, Saint Paul's Abbey meeting up in Newton. And uh, I remember sitting out after the meeting, I was definitely feeling more awake. I was feeling happy. I was feeling uh, better. And I remember sitting on the stairs with, with this guy, Pat, and this guy, Gary, and, uh, you know, just kind of talking about the meeting. I don't remember what the meeting was about, but I remember feeling good. Um, and uh, that was at like 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon. And the next thing I remember was sitting in front of a campfire with a beer in my hand and going, well, how did I get here? I really honestly don't remember what happened between, I don't remember leaving the Abbey. I don't remember getting in a car. I don't remember who I was with. All I remember is kind of like coming to with a beer in my hand at a, on a campfire. I have no idea where I was. Um, thinking, well, that's, that's not good. I don't, I don't think this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And then I just drank the rest of the night. You know, I remember waking up in the back of a car the next morning, uh, going, um, oh, here we are again. It's basically, you know, for, for me, when I was drinking, there was an acceptance of any time when I woke up, it was just like, okay, uh, or, okay, here we are. You know, it was for me, there was no, um, there was no point to figuring out what happened because it didn't matter. I drank. Nobody's shocked. Here I am. Figure out where you are. Figure out who you're with, and figure out how to get where you need to be. So. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> the uh, and then the, the next thing that uh, I have highlighted is that uh, the doctor's theory that we have an allergy to alcohol interests us. Um, you know, I, I like that. I like that. Um, I don't even know what the word is. I'm drawing a blank. I like that mind of thinking for it because it's so easy to grasp, you know. Um, you know, I, I've been sober for long enough that I've encountered situations where people are asking me why I don't drink. Um, or they'll offer to buy me a drink and I'll say no and they go, what? And I'm like, yeah, I don't drink. And they're like, oh, why? And then uh, I say I'm allergic. You know, and it's something that people get like that. It's like, oh, cool. You know, an allergy is something that everybody understands. An allergy is essentially... A, a abnormal response to some substance that's introduced to the body. Um, and that's exactly what, what the effect of alcohol has on my body. You know, the, the symptom is that I then just drink compulsively and without any sense of control. Um, no one needs to know that. Um, but, you know, it, like I said, it was something that was super easy to grasp, you know, grasp, you know, so like, when I, when I, when I first got to AA, it was, yeah, I'm not, I don't control my drinking and I really, I can't, I won't, and I, I, I know I can't drink. Uh, but you know, it wasn't really until I got into the uh, into the big book a couple of years later in uh, in, Ber- in Burnersville where we really started getting into the you know exactly why why is that why can't you control your drinking um, what is it that um, that makes you that way exactly what kind of time bomb are you um, you know so yeah the the concept of the allergy is 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 is, is it's so simple you know it's such an it's such an easy concept. I hit that one. I did that one okay. You did good. <laughs> um, and this is uh, Beth. What you know? You can. You know, we work out our solution on the spiritual as well as an altruistic plane. Um, that's one of the principles that you know we wanted to hit on. You want to? Yeah, I mean it's a principle that we 
we work out the, our solution on a spiritual, which is an inner, right? We go in and we find God, um, as well as an altruistic, which is the outer, and we're of service to others, plain. And that's something that we're supposed to be doing in our lives as sober alcoholics, is right? So that we're doing our 11th step in the morning and at night. We're taking that 10th step during the day where we're doing that spot check and checking in with God. Um, and that's that inner stuff, right? That's that stuff that, you know, got to take care of me kind of stuff. Um, and then there's the altruistic plane, which is the outer stuff, right? So the, the handy dandy dictionary right here. Um, my understanding of altruistic is unselfish, unselfish action, A-L-T. Let's see. Let's see what the dictionary has to say. Altruistic, helping others, showing concern for the welfare of others. So in the more at night, I make an inventory of my day. Where was I? You know, where was I resentful? Where was I selfish? Do I keep anything to myself that I need to talk to somebody about? All that stuff, right? In the morning, I look at the 24 hours ahead, and I ask God to connect with me in a way and that I can connect with him in a way that I can be of service to the people about me, whether it's my kids, whether it's the car insurance company. we got to pay the garbage bill. Um, wait, wait, wait. Shit. Um, let's do that. Um, right? So for me, for me in my natural state, uh, it, it's the opposite, right? I'm out there trying to make everybody else do something for me, right? So I'm trying to work on their inner, right? The sick alcoholic, I want to fix your insides to do what I want to do. And then I want to do things for myself on the outside. So I want to go shopping and I want to buy things. You know what I mean? Like consumerism and all that kind of stuff for me. Um, but when we get into sobriety, it's it, one of the principles is, is that we work out the, right? The solution is with me and God. And... The, that's half of the solution, and the other half of the solution is being of service to other people in my life. Um, then it goes on to say that we favor hospitalization for the alcoholic who is still jittery befogged. More often than not, it is imperative that a man's brain be cleared before he's approached, as he is then in a better has a better chance of understanding and accepting what we have to offer. And I have a ha ha story about that. I totally forgot till now. Um, me and my girlfriend, we were living in Hapakong at the time, and we had this really awesome house. And we had this roommate who had a little girl, and she rented the downstairs, and we rented the upstairs. And um, she uh, she was supposed to be sober, and she's trying to get custody back of her daughter. And she uh, she asked if she could go out and watch the baby for a couple hours. Well, she she came home at like 11:30, 12, like smashed out of her mind, and. You know, the way the house was set up, you kind of walk into the living room, and then there's, like, two couches kind of just, and you have to, like, walk right by to get anywhere in the house. And she literally opens up the door, and you don't see anybody come in. She's literally crawling on her hands and knees to try to sneak by us, which was absolutely like Me and Meg are just watching there, watching, sitting there watching the X-Files, and we're kind of looking at each other, and we're like, what? So um, we, we figured, right, we're, we're you know, newly in, newly in the book, I guess, or... Thought we were, I don't even think we were even in the book yet. Yeah, we had no idea what we were doing. So uh, so we decided we were going to 12-step this girl. And um, and we sat down with her, and we talked to her about alcoholism and the fact that her daughter was downstairs sleeping, and she's supposed to be sober, and she put our, our names on the line, and we just, you know... You know, and she... We literally, within an hour, got her to the place where she was really ready to do this deal. She was really sincerely ready to do this deal in between the throwing up and the slurring of words... And, um, and the next morning she woke up and she didn't remember any of it. None of it. Just completely like in a black, I'm assuming she's either in a blackout or she was just like, I don't know what you two people are talking about. You guys are crazy. Um, and she promptly moved out. So, um, she remembered. I don't know. She remembered. Shut up. So, yeah. So anyway, um, I am I am a supporter of detox and I am a supporter of 28 day rehabs. I think that they're wonderful. I love IOP after after people get you know girls come out of uh, rehab and they go to IOP for a couple of weeks or a month or two months or whatever it is, um, because it gives them a chance. And I know it's going to sound horrible and I, I might take a beating for this one, but it gives them a chance to piss, moan, and complain to somebody else. Um, and then when they show up, they're ready to do step work. You know, you want to figure out your living arrangements, go to IOP. You want to figure out what you're doing with your daddy, you know, your baby daddy, go to IOP. Um, you know, and work out those life kind of things and get your head head on straight in that, that matter. But when you're ready to show up at my house, we're going to be talking about God. 
I just want you to know you said baby daddy, and it's recorded. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I'm a full supporter of those things. I think that they have their place, and I think that um, – I think – they fought me. So uh, I think that our job, right, our job as sponsors is solely to get people to God, right? We're not the arbiter of anybody's sex affairs or living arrangements or any of that stuff. Um, and fortunately for us, there are lots of professionals out there who are willing to step in and help people on that level so that our mission and, the, and, and our uh, focus can be where it's supposed to be, which is getting the human being sitting across the table or sitting on the couch you know, next to me, to God. That's what my role in your life is. That's my only role, so. Yeah, and, um, you know, the other thing is that, you know, we say, what does it say? Um, man's brain be cleared before we approach. You know, I think the assumption here is that, like, you know, it's a few days. You know, let the guy sober up, get back to a place where he's coherent and can understand English again. Um, you know, I, I think it's worth mentioning, though, that, you know, I've seen people who can who can exist in AA, um, who drank alcoholically, and can remain free from alcohol for an extended period of time. Um, and these guys, some of these people are, they are not in a place where they can really wrap their heads around a big book solution. Um, there you go. I think that you know, and, and I'm not I'm not promoting this as a methodology for staying sober. You know, come to AA, chill until you're ready. It's a couple years, it's a couple years. But you know what? It happens. You know what I mean? And if someone's staying free from alcohol, um, then there's a power at work in that person's life. If they're an actual ha- alcoholic of a hopeless variety, there's a power at work in that person's life that I'm not aware of. You know, And I can continue to offer this spiritual toolkit, and they can continue to not understand it, and then one day maybe they'll all click, and then, and then they'll get it. I've seen it happen. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, I think yeah. that that's important. And, you know, that there's a, there's a certain percentage of, of the big book population that, that have this, like, you know, get into the book, or you're not sober, you know, do this, or you're not sober, and that's an admission that you're not powerless and that you're not beyond human aid. You know, the people that come in, I know quite a few of them, um, that they come in and out and they come in and out, and the only answer that I have is, is that God has either removed the problem or he hasn't. You know, I'm not, I'm not that powerful. You know, girls, you know, I used to think that, you know, I remember when, when Cass first took me through the book, I said, I don't sponsor people because they all drink on me. And, um, you know, she just kind of was like, yeah, 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 shut up and do the work. But, um, but the, but the reality of the situation is, is that if we think in any way, shape or form that we're handing people a solution and it's what gets them sober, we're, we're making an admission that we are not powerless, that we are not beyond human aid, and that we understand God's will better than God. And again, it talks, you know, I'm, uh, I love talking about it. You know, as soon as my ego gets leveled, it immediately starts to build. And that's one of the ways that we become agnostic in Alcoholics Anonymous in the book. I mean, it's, it's absolutely baffling how my mind and my ego can play such an active role in the solution that saved my life. Here, I'm going to give you this foot, this, these, these steps, and you're going to get sober. I mean, that's just, it's ludicrous. It's absolutely, it goes against everything that we say we believe. Um, but it happens. It happens to me. It happens to all the girls that I, you know, all of my peers in Alcoholics Anonymous. At some point, we all turn around, and they're, and they're like, I wish I could have done something differently. When in reality, it's never been about me. It's about the person and their higher power, and it's only about the person and their higher power. My job is to lay this, the tit, the kit of tools at their feet. <laughs> <laughs> We're really mature. Sorry. That's um, recorded also. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> my job is to lay this kit of tools at your feet, right? Give you my personal experience with them in the hopes that you will do this with your God. So... Yep. I said that. You did. I'm I got to brag for a second. I have never liked speaking in front of people. Um, and I've recently, this week, just today, discovered that if I just take my glasses off, it's like you're not even here. <laughs> Everybody in the front row could give me the finger right now and I'd be like, it's awesome. But I had to put them on so I can see the book. So then I. Um, you want to say something about. 
Uh, that. I don't remember. Okay. What does it say? Moral psychology. This is the, you know, so we weren't going to really dive into this paragraph because it gets dove into a lot. Um, but it's important, you know. This is, I think, this is the, the we doctors paragraph. Uh, I have realized for a long time, you, you, do you remember? No? Okay. Keep going, I'll pick that up some time. form of moral psychology was a virgin importance to alcoholics, but its applications presented difficulties beyond our, con mm. our conception. Uh, what with our ultra modern standards and our scientific approach to everything, we are perhaps not well equipped to apply the powers of good that lie outside our synthetic knowledge. You know, I think this is a doctor's way of saying more than human power. You know, in its simplest form, when you yeah. break that paragraph right down to it, more than human power. We can't help alcoholics of the hopeless variety. Yeah, the thing, right, the thing that brought to my mind when we were reading this uh, this morning was that I don't know if it's a human thing or if it's an American thing, I'm not quite sure, but there's a huge divide between science and faith. And in order for alcoholics to get what we're talking about, we have to have both. We have a sickened body, right? The science of our body, whether it's the enzymes in our livers, the physical allergy, how, you know, mentally, you know, a mental deficiency on any level, those two things are on the science level. And then we have the spiritual malady, which is on the spiritual level, um, which is one of the reasons why I love Einstein so much. He loves to mix the two, right? I think that it's so important and it's so um, difficult in our culture. I don't know if it's human nature, but in order to, to bring those two together is the only way to truly understand the, the totality of alcoholism. Um, it's not one or the other. It's both, they're combined, you know, like the, the fabric of our lives, not only is it woven through in fear, right? Right? Fear is shot through in the fabric. Um, we have to put these two things together because if we do one or we do the other, we're lacking an understanding of who we actually are. So, did I say that right? I think so. All right. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, then there's another principle a little bit further on that we wanted to hit on. Um, while here, he acquired some ideas which he put into practical application at once. Um, it's funny because I think this kind of flies in the face of what we were talking about just a second ago. Like sometimes it takes a little while before people can really get with this kind of stuff. Uh, I think what the key here is that once you acquire these ideas, once you're in a place where you can take these ideas, action becomes paramount. You know? Once, once you get to a place where you understand exactly why you're out powerless uh, over alcohol in a, in, a, in a physical and, and emotional and spiritual way, you better get to work. You know, you know path of application at once. You know, even after the third step, it says we launched into our, maybe it's not the third, whatever it is, we launched into our, the next in course, course of action. Um, yeah, we launched into inventory, right. But it's like, you know, we don't take a break, we don't pause, we don't like, we need a vacation. Um, well, I think it also speaks to, this is not a program of suggestions, it's a suggested program of recovery. Right. Yeah. If you're going to do it, do it. Right. When it's presented to you, when it's, you know, when it was presented to me, when I was at that hopeless spot, when I was, my ego had been completely leveled and then immediately started to build, it was do these things now, right? right. If we it's, pause, yeah. it's bad. Right. And you talk about, you know, it's a suggested program of recovery, you know, in the, the book, you know, in the book, alcoholic, we as alcoholics now admit that we don't have the monopoly on getting so, getting and staying sober, right? You know, but this is our method, you know? So don't do pieces of this and say it didn't work because you didn't do this, you know? So, anywho, now to be able to see again. Um... Uh, we believe, and so suggested a few years ago, that the action of alcohol in these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all, and once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon things human, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to stop. Um, this is kind of what I was hitting on a little bit earlier, you know, the idea that it's this physical compulsion, you know, that makes me drink alcoholically, and once I'm, when I'm completely caught up in that physical compulsion, and I realize how powerless I am over it, you know, maybe I'm not calling it powerless yet, maybe I'm not saying I'm an alcoholic yet, but I know, you know what I mean? We know, you know, we know when we're in, in the shit, you know, and, and we're in a place where we can't do something about it, um, you know, and, and we start to become spiritually demoralized. Here I am. I thought I was like a fairly, you know, 
to be around a strong guy. I can't even just stop drinking. Um, you know, and uh, and then all of a sudden problems pile up. You know, spirituality starts to, to, to become front and center. And now all of a sudden I think I have an excuse to drink, right? You know, I think this sort of illustrates how one thing leads into the other, you know. Um, once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence and reliance upon thing, things human, their problems pile up on them. That's exactly how it was. Like I said, you know, I had a very unremarkable drinking career. I did not go to jail. I didn't get in a lot of trouble. You know, I was really quiet, really, for, a, for, a, for an untreated alcoholic. You know, I caused refuge in my family and in my own life um, and something within my friends, but I wasn't like a danger to society. Um, <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, but, but, so for, for me, when I was drinking, there wasn't that I was drinking to escape. Maybe I was like, oh, my parents, you know, that kind of nonsense. Um, but it went for me, I wasn't drinking to escape a spiritual deficit. I was drinking because I like to drink. And then I was drinking because I couldn't stop, you know. And once I couldn't stop drinking, then my spirit started to be started to deteriorate. Then all of a sudden, I was drinking because I couldn't stop drinking. I was drinking because I needed to get away from the fact that I was powerless over something in my life. I need to get away from the fact that that powerless and, 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 and is becoming so much a part of my life that it's causing other problems and other wreckage. And now I'm upsetting my parents, I'm upsetting my friends, and I'm causing wreckage, and I'm doing this and doing that. I'm you know stealing little bits of money. Like I said, nothing bad because I was too scared. Um, but you know, it's uh, it's definitely this this, this 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 downward spiral, right? That really started with the fact that I have a physical compulsion to drink, and then once I put alcohol in my body, all bets are off. Yep. That's it. Right. You got nothing. Man. What? You got nothing. I got nothing. You got nothing. Um, and then, of course, frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices. The message which can interest and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight. Um, why did I say that? Oh. So, this idea of froth, do you mind if I go first again? Yeah, right. Okay. This idea of frothy emotional appeal, you know, it's like, oh, you should stop drinking, you're gonna do bad at school, you're gonna lose your kids, you're gonna, your wife's gonna leave you, you're gonna, whatever. What an insert reason why you should stop drinking. Um, you know, these, this, 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 this kind of appeal, this kind of argument is ineffective on two fronts, right? So if I'm already drinking and I have a physical compulsion going on, it doesn't matter who says what. It doesn't matter what I say. Forget about anybody else. You know, um, if I'm making that decision to stop drinking and I can't do it while I'm in the throes of the physical compulsion, and certainly my mother telling me that she's going to ground me if I drink again. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then on, on the other hand, um, you know, and, and we're not really talking about it here in depth yet, but you know, the mental obsession. You know, the idea that. Uh, I have a delusion about the way I drink. You know, I have a delusion which tells me that I don't have a physical allergy. I don't have a physical compulsion that, I, it, that makes it so I cannot take alcohol in any form safely, right? Um, so when somebody's talking to me about spiritual, you know, or frothy emotional appeal and all, all the reasons why I can't drink, I believe that. It just doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Um, that frothy emotional appeal, it's... It's, it's like an appeal to my common sense, but it's almost like it's, it's like an appeal to my spirit, right? But we just said, we got to, we, we got to this place, right? If we're in this place where we're, where, where we're drinking so badly and so out of control that other people are now trying to convince us that we need to stop, that we have a problem that we need to address, um, my spirit is already in trouble. And they're trying to appeal to my sick spirit to make me not drink. Um, and it, you know, it just doesn't work because... Of, you know, physical allergy and the, and, and the uh, mental obsession. For me, um, the message which can interest and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight um, is a principle for me. Um, it's that when I'm meeting with an alcoholic, when God calls me to task, I need to show up, right? I don't need to, um, you know, just, you know, well, you know, read these pages and, you know, or do this or do that. It, it, you know, for me personally... Um, it's, it's that I have to get open and I have to get vulnerable and I have to get intimate with the people that are sitting across the table from me. Um, because this is, you know, 
I know for myself, and I've met so many people, that they get this moment of grace in their life where they come and they actually ask for help. And that moment of grace and the ego rebuilds and crashes it and it's gone. Um, and they're out the door. You know, my personal responsibility to the women in this program is, is that I'm here to carry out God's will for me. And if God puts somebody in my life that is asking me for help, to help them get to God, my job is to show up. You know, um, one of my best friends, Elizabeth, she says all the time, just suit up and show up. And I, uh, you know, this was huge for me. This plagued me for 15, 16 years in AA um, where I had a hard time just showing up. You know, um, getting vulnerable, I can do that on a one-on-one -on -one basis. That's something I, I got good at in the beginning of going through the book. But actually showing up and taking that risk, knowing that I was going to get open and vulnerable, that was huge. Um, and so my girlfriend Elizabeth, she would just say, just show up. And I'd say, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm supposed to say. I don't know how I'm supposed to act. I don't understand the parameters of the situation, right? The alcoholic mind just goes in a billion directions. It's total anarchy. And she would say, just show up and God will show you what to do, right? So again, it calls me to task that A, I've got to be connected. I've got to be connected as often as I possibly can or else God's going to ask me to show up and I'm not going to have that ability on my own. I can't do that. I can't show up and give you me, right? What did Anne Marie say the other night? She goes, uh, intimacy, into me, you see which I thought was brilliant. I've never heard that before. Into me, you see. So I'm going to I'm gonna shed all of my layers of self-protection and allow you to experience who I am because that message has depth and weight. No, my drinking doesn't look like yours. No, my family doesn't look like yours. No, my lifestyle doesn't look like yours. We have nothing absolutely in common, and yet you sit across the table from me, and we're completely on the same page. It can only happen if I allow you to see into me, into my spirit, and the alcoholism that lives there. So. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> um, and then the next thing that. Uh, we have, uh, uh, men and women drink essentially. I'm not looking that we might go long. I, we just didn't think we could cover an hour with this. But, all right. Men and women think drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. Yes. The sensation yes. is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot after a time differentiate the truth from the false. And then their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again, again experience a sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks, drinks which they see others taking with impunity. Um, you know, for me, I think a lot of the – a lot of the uh, – Again, after after you know the spiritual malady really piled on to me, a lot of my drinking was because of the the sense of ease and comfort that was missing in my life, right? You know, and I don't know about anybody else, but it, it got to the point where I'd be you know locked into my crappy apartment, and I finally you know, after coming back from my 20 minute trip to get alcohol, and I take that first drink, and it was kind of like. <sighs> You know, and I, I, I could breathe again. Was, I could just get back to a place where, okay, now I can function for five minutes, maybe. <laughs> Seems like a good you know. idea, right? Right. Um, you know, and and and, and then <laughs> and then the and then the uh, you know the the, the the phenomenon of craving kicks in and and, and, and I'm off. Um, but at its very core, that drink was about trying to address that spiritual not that sense of ease, that that's uh, restlessness, irritable, and discontentedness. That you know, trying to chase after that sense of ease and comfort. And when I get here, right, and when I'm giving up drinking, I'm not, I'm not gonna. I, I know that I can't have alcohol anymore. You know, um, that sense of ease and comfort and that sense of contentment. That's what I need in my life in order to stay sober. You know, that's the psychic change that I'm going to experience by going through these steps. That's what I get from a relationship with a higher power. Um, the sense of ease and comfort, uh, the idea that, um, you know, I don't need to walk through my life afraid, you know, all the, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I lost my train of thought. All right. But that's, that's pretty much it, you know. That, well, go ahead. For me, this, this paragraph brings up a time in my life where I had two small children ages, what, one and three, two and four, um, you know, and, and I'm in the preschool stages of life. And for anybody that's ever had preschoolers, you get it. For anybody who hasn't had two small preschoolers, it's like hell on earth. Um, 
And then there's the four o'clock, five o'clock witching hour, which which everybody who has kids understands that you get to that point in the day and you're just you're just cooked. You're just like just get dinner on the table, give them baths, and just put them in a bed somewhere. I don't care if they sleep, just get them away from me. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I'm a good mom. Um, but I had the pleasure of having six and a half years in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, my AA life down there was very small. I had a couple of people that I was very close with. I was not really super connected in the AA community. Um, also, in the state life, stage of life I was in, I was very connected to the preschool and all preschool moms. Um, and the number one thing that the preschool moms in general, me being the only alcoholic in the group, well, sober alcoholic in the group, um, was that at 4 or 5 o'clock, everybody would post on Facebook about their glass of wine. And I was like, F you, man. I got to make a phone call. I got to write in a journal. I got to sit down and get with God. I got to call another alcoholic. And y'all get to have a glass of wine, right? And it was. It, it was all about that sense of release, right? We're, we're almost there. We're almost to that, you know, <clears throat> bedtime is coming. And, uh, and, and all of my girlfriends down there are taking a glass of wine, sometimes a bottle of wine, a couple of them maybe seeing at some point in the future. I don't know. Um, but for me, right, me, I'm an alcoholic, and I would love that, that peace and ease, right, that just that, that release, that exhale that we all get. Um, and for us, it requires, right, that 10th step is to pause, right? We ask God to get involved in that moment, and 8 out of 10 times the phone would ring with a sponsee or, uh, you know, Dan would call and, and I would be able to talk to him, which I'm so grateful that he's, you know, also walking this path. And, um, you know, or I would call, you know, my girlfriend Beth, who's in school, and I'd be like, can you take a break? I need a break. And that's how I get my ease and comfort, right? But if we're not working this spiritual program on our alcoholic life seems the only normal one, it's very easy to put ourselves in, in the new person's shoes where the only thing they can do, they know what's going to happen if they take that 5 o'clock glass of wine. We all know what's going to happen. But at that time during the day, right, that's what it looks like. This is what it looks like, is I need something to take the edge off to get through the rest of the day. I don't have a program of recovery. I don't have a network. I don't have a sponsor. And my only choice is then to take a drink and therefore starting the whole thing. And then the next thing you know, I'm getting in the car with my kids and I'm drunk and you know, we've heard that story a hundred times. So, you know, and it's worth mentioning that you know, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm trying to describe the sense of uh, restlessness, irritable, irritability, and discontentment um, uh, of of al- a bunch of alcoholism, and the sense of ease and comfort that comes with the drink. Um, and like I said, we, we you know we want to replace that in our lives. It's worth mentioning that once we when we're going through the steps and we've had that spiritual experience and the ninth step promises are happening in our lives, that effect becomes so much more permanent. Mm-hmm. Than, you know, than, than than any any bit of alcohol could do. You know, I mean, it was literally that 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 ease and comfort was so fleeting when it was a drink. You know, it was so temporary. You know, um, but that sense of contentment and that sense of spiritual ease and spiritual comfort, you know, that we get from having this psychic change and having this spiritual experience that it talks about in this book. I mean, it's 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 way more permanent. And like Beth said, you know. Shit crops up. <laughs> when these things crop up. Anyway, um, on the next page, or further down, that I'm actually continuing. Once a psychic change has occurred, the very same person who seemed doomed, who had so many problems he despaired of ever solving them, suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol. The only effort is necessary being that required to follow a few simple rules. Um, and this, this is, a, you know, it hits us on a couple levels. Like again, just going back to what I just said, you know. Once a psychic change has occurred, the very same person who seemed doomed, you know, suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol. It's not just the desire for alcohol that gets so easy to be controlled, right? It's you know, I'm spiritually content all of a sudden. Once that psych- once I've had that psychic change, I'm not prey to misery and depression. You know, I can be useful in my life and to other people. I can make a living. You know, I can control my emotional nature. Um, all these things that make untreated alcoholism what untreated alcoholism is all about go away you know so much so that when i've seen people who i haven't seen in years 
And I'm talking about after time that I've spent in AA and sober, um, three, four, five years later, I see them again for the first time and they don't know who I am. You know what I mean? I think Beth had the same experience. But, you know, walking up to somebody that I've known forever and then being like, man, you are so different. I almost didn't ever know it was you, you know? Um, and there's a story in here about that. You know, there's a story in here about that. Uh, just a little, little, little further on that, you know, somebody walked into a doctor's office and said, hey, can you hook me up with other alcoholics? And the guy was like, who the hell are you? <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and, and it's and it's crazy. You know what I mean? Like, the first time that happened to me, it was almost a little off-putting. I was like, "What did I do? Like, I don't know. Like, what, what do you mean? I'm not like me. I'm the same I ever was." I almost got offended by it. Um, you know, but then I was thinking about it later that, that that day or that night or whatever, and it was like, "Well, I am different." You know what I mean? I'm entirely different. Mm -hmm. You know, um, my entire psychology has changed. You know, I do things outside of my house and outside of my job that I never would have even, I wouldn't know, I would have dreamed about doing and I would have watched everybody else do, you know um, and because of this change because of the way uh, because of the, the spiritual experience that I've had, I can go out and participate in life, you know um, it, you know, later on in the book it talks about keeping on the firing line, well so you know I go on the firing line and I, and I also get on like, it's not, not the firing line, you know, I just hang out with normal people you know, I go and I do stuff that I like That's to do. That's the firing line, man. <laughs> I, go, I go out and I get, I get engaged in stuff that I like to do simply because it's stuff that I like to do. You know what I mean? Things that would have terrified me. Forget, never mind what they were. Just going into a setting where I didn't know everything already would be terrifying. You know, walking into the room and being the guy with the least amount of information, terrifying. Never would have done it. You know what I mean? I do that on a regular basis now. Um because I know just about nothing about the thing that I like to do the most. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know. That's all I got on that. But, well, for me, the, the important statement or the, 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 the operative word in this paragraph is the word suddenly. You know, I don't work on my character defects. I don't remove my alcoholism. I don't, I don't do these things. You know, when, when I hear suddenly, um, I think God. You know, God removes those character defects. God relieves me of my alcoholism. God puts me in a state of grace where I get the opportunity, right, to do this work. I don't do that. God does that. You know, suddenly finds himself e able to control his desire for alcohol. Um, you know, and he, he, he talks about once this psychic change occurs, now we're talking about the doctor, but for me what I hear is once this person's had a spiritual experience, right, which we know is the result of these steps, right? So now I'm in step nine. All of a sudden I'm having a spiritual experience. I'm not the same person that I was. I don't get to take credit for it. And I get to go out and do all the things that I always dreamed of doing, and I get to, sh I get to show up, right? Elizabeth always says, suit up and show up. I get that opportunity now. I've had that that psychic change. I'm moving through this, and and then it and it follows up with right. This is a conditional program. The only effort necessary being that required to follow a few simple rules, right? I need to do these things in order to maintain a clear connection between me and my God. As soon as that connection gets clogged up, fear, resentment, right, power, ego starts to clear that starts to clog that connection with God and it's not something that we do it just happens because that's who we are that's our nature as alcoholics we're egotistical fearful and angry then all of a sudden I'm not in a state of grace anymore right and, and unfortunately we don't always pick up a drink my experience and what I watched Dan go through was not pick up a drink completely clogging that connection Staying sober, sober solely by the grace of God, and our entire lives crumbling around us. You know, everything on the outside for the first time in our lives, with like uh, I don't know how much time we had, with fifteen and sixteen, nine, twelve years, 12 years sober. Um, everything on the outside looked okay, right? Kids going to school, husbands going to job. I think about cleaning the house sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we're doing the deal. And our entire, the, the entire infrastructure of our life completely crumbled, mm -hmm. right? We just, we just totally, we stopped doing the 11th step, stopped doing, stopped participating in our relationship with our higher power, stopped following a few simple rules, right? And we get to get all of that stuff that we didn't have, all of that stuff that all the gifts of recovery, right? All of the stuff that's a product 
of God being in our lives is suddenly gone. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's be clear, right? I mean, like like she just said, freedom uh, or, or, or freedom from alcohol is not necessarily, you know, like when I've seen people free from alcohol for years and years and years in, in AA. You know what I mean? Oh, um, just freedom from alcohol. <laughs> these requirements are not for freedom from alcohol. Freedom from alcohol is for that sense of spiritual freedom. Right. Or uh, these 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 uh, require the, these simple rules. That, they're, they're, those rules are the requirements for uh, that sense of freedom, that sense of spiritual freedom, and ease and comfort, and and all the gifts of the, that that we get from the nine step promises, um, and all the other promises too. You know, those are what those are what the, the, the those rules are required for. You know, you can exist in AA and stay and, and stay without a drink. Um, you know, and that's not pretty. Like she just said, we, I, I've been there, you know, we've been there, and you there, too. I said, wait. <laughs> I said, wait. It's on tape. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I've been, you know I, I've been there, and, it, and it's true. You know, you start, you stop doing this deal, you stop following these rules, and it goes away. Yep. You know, it goes away, and everything around you suffers. The people around you suffer. Um, our work suffered. That suffered. Kids suffered. And, you know, to, to the outside... Like she said, everything looked hunky dory, but you know we were kind of just falling apart inside, on our own. We weren't even falling apart together. We were falling apart apart. Apart. Mm-hmm. You know, because um, there was no there was no this. There was no connection here. There was no connection anywhere. There was just you know I, I know I was at least in a very isolated state. You know you, I could have been living in my own room all the time. You did. Okay. <laughs> um. So yeah. Yeah, so I think it just speaks to, you know, the doctors, the, the doc, in the doctor's opinion, it's pointing out to us that, you know, we do this deal and God does the rest, mm. right? God removes the alcoholism, God removes the character defects, and we get to show up, right? That's all we have to do is we get to show up. Um, and we're short on time, so I think I'm going to jump ahead a ways. Um, following his physical rehabilitation, he had talked. He had talked with me, um, in which he frankly stated he thought the, tra- the treatment a waste of effort, unless I could assure him, which no one ever had, that in the future he would have the willpower to resist the impulse to drink. That guy was ready to take steps. You know, that guy was hopeless. That guy was an alcoholic of the hopeless variety, completely beaten into a state of submission by alcohol. That guy knew he couldn't do it. That guy knew he didn't have the willpower. Guarantee it that I'll have the willpower, and then I'll do. Then I'll do what you're talking about. Otherwise, don't even bother. I can't go through another you know, set of bullshit just so whatever. Um, you know, this guy has knowledge of his of his condition. You know what I mean? And I think that I, I know for me at least when I was when I was that that last night in in that crappy New York apartment, um, that's where I was at. I wasn't calling it willpower, but I knew that I had no I had no method by which I could stay. So, so we could not drink, you know. Um, you know, and going back to what we said at the beginning, you know, the, the first thing that's completely necessary for, for, for this program to really um, be effective for any individual alcoholic is that they're completely 100% hopeless. Yeah. There's a case that um, we've been dealing with recently with somebody that we've known for quite a while who, uh, who had been sober and is, is, was no longer sober and is now not drinking um, and unwilling to do this. Um, and it's heartbreaking. It's, it's absolutely heartbreaking to watch somebody that I saw her devastated by this disease, and then I saw her work with a woman and followed her story a little closely over the years and watched the freedom in her life watched it deteriorate completely powerless over it. Um, you know, found out that she got, she got high, she got drunk. Um, everybody, you know, everybody rallied around her. Everybody wanted to help her. Um, got her into an inpatient program, you know, got her into a halfway house. And then all of a sudden, you know, that, uh, the self-will and that that ego was very, 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 is very, very much alive and well inside of her. And there's a bunch of us now kind of standing around feeling, really, really, truly feeling on, on a very, very foundational level the powerlessness of this disease over somebody that we love very, very much. Um, 
And again, it goes back to God's either removed the problem or he hasn't. You know, I, I know this woman. I've seen her. She, she did, you know, she would do big book studies in her house and she would have people over all the time. She's all about service. She was working with others. She would go to meetings and she was doing this deal. She stopped doing a couple of things, wound up back out there. Now we're, we're doing everything that we humanly can to help her. And she's just not there. You know, I talked to her on the phone, and I'm literally talking to the beast. And I can't hear her at all. All I hear is the beast. Um, she is not where this guy, I think this was Fritz M. She is not where he's at. She is not, um, she's not beaten down. And it's so incredibly frightening to me um, that somebody that could have such an understanding of the freedom and experience this kind of freedom could go so far off track. It's an, it's just a reminder to me how fragile, right? How fragile this deal is, how fragile this experience is, and how I myself treat it. I don't treat it with the respect that it deserves. You know, I do. I think that I'm better than, and I think that I work a good program, and I think that, oh, I don't need to do my 11th step tonight, or I don't need to call a sponsee back, or screw it, I, I went to a meeting three weeks ago, I don't need to go tonight. You know, I think I'm okay. It's just me reminding myself and my pride that I'm not powerless over alcohol and that I've got it. I don't know where that came from. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to jump back and see what the last thing I'm going to say, but it's on the same page just above that. It says, from a trembling, despairing, nervous wreck had emerged a man bringing, brimming over with self-reliance and contentment. Um, you know, the thing I take most away from that is that people can see it, mm -hmm. right? When we have this, when we live this deal and we've, and, we, and we've had that experience and we're, and we're living this lifestyle, people can see it. You know what I mean? People can see it outside the room. People can see it inside the room. If I go into, if I, if I go into a meeting, uh, contemporary AA, you know what I mean? They can see it. All I need to do is show up, speak, share my experience, you know, maybe some strength and hope, and, and people can see it. You know, it happens to her all the time. You know what I mean? It, it, you know, in, in those places where, where, where people need the most help in AA, you know, it doesn't take a lot. You know, it, it doesn't have to be hard work to go and convince anybody, you know, because the people that are ready for, t for this kind of living see it in other people, you know. And I t I'm telling you, they get inquisitive. You know, they get like, why do you live like that? Like, what is that? How are you? What? Show me. Yeah. You know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't take a lot. And that's all I have. Yeah. No, I went, no. well, just real quick. I went to, uh, in North Carolina, I only spoke once or twice the entire time I was down there. And I was asked to do step 10 and 11, I think, at a retreat. And, uh, you know, I, I literally just shared from the book. I didn't share any, like, really cool, wild experience with meditation. I literally just shared this stuff from the book. And I had a woman come up to me after, and she asked us for a ride home. And she had 30 years of sobriety, and she'd never been taken through the book. And, uh, and she, she looks at me, and she goes, where do you get this? Where did that come from? And I'm like, I read it to you from the book. <laughs> it's like, nothing crazy, people. It's like right here. Um and I get that all the time. You know, we, we kind of talked about it last week about, you know, going to contemporary AA meetings or going to meetings where people aren't doing this deal and just sharing our experience. I get people who come up to me a lot. In Charlotte, I would get texts like once or twice a month like, hey, Beth, does it, does it say this in the big book? Where does it say this in the big book? You know, and I would text them back pages and I would say, if you want to talk about it, give me a call. But I was like, you know what I mean? But it's like people will ask me, you know, where did you get that? Or who told you that? Or, what do you mean there's three questions after the ninth step? Who told you that? Where did you get that from? You know, um, you know, and, the, and, and then where I got sober, you know, I went up there. I was up there for six and a half, seven years. And then, um, you know, went down to Burnsville, actually worked, started working a program out of the program Alcoholics Anonymous and uh I started going back up there, and people would approach me, people that had known me since I'm 17 years old, and, like, you know, I was a lunatic, like, beyond, ricochet rabbit. Um, and people would walk up to me and be like, what happened to you? What is different? There's, you're so different. What did you do? What happened? You know, it wasn't anything I did. It was God. But, again, it speaks to that. Our job is to suit up and show up and be who we are, be willing to be vulnerable in the moment, be willing to expose our process for what it is, not for what we want other people to see. 
and and it just it happens. So God's good, man. Mm-hmm. God's rock star. God rocks. That's it. That's it. So yeah. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.